We're all set? Okay, good. Almost. If you want to lower that, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Bruce, and I should preface that by saying I've come by the nickname honestly. I'm actually a physician. I'm a neurologist, retired. A uh, neurologist, not a surgeon, so I treat people, treated people, with uh, everything from migraine, back pain, stroke, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, the whole variety of brain, spinal cord, nerve, and muscle diseases, but medically, not surgically, I'm not a surgeon. My strokes. Pardon? <laughs> yes. Prior to that, in my previous uh, background, I was in computer science at the University of Pittsburgh and cross matriculated at Carnegie Mellon University. I worked for many years with an expert system that was designing computer aided medical diagnosis projects. Uh, you'll notice when you go to your doctor, they may be typing into a computer these days. They're doing data entry. They are not asking the computer what's wrong with you because, quite frankly, it didn't work. And there were lots of reasons why computer-aided medical diagnosis didn't work then, and I'm not terribly optimistic that it's going to work yet. But the easiest way to explain it is garbage in, garbage out. We found fairly quickly that if we had our system, and it was one of the better ones around at the time in the 70s, if you had an expert physician putting data in, it looked like a genius. It would come up with a terrific differential diagnosis, and it would make wonderful suggestions, and it looks very smart if you had an expert putting data in. If you had a third year medical student putting data in, the stuff you got out looked like a third year medical student. It was completely nonsense, and it just didn't make any, any difference. We thought we could get something that we could have a, a medically trained, but not necessarily medical expert, inputting data and getting expert opinions out. It never worked. It really didn't. So, although there are some medical expert systems out there, they're, they're not common, they're not in common use because of garbage in, garbage out. The people who don't need them, the experts, don't need them. The people who do need them are the ones that are inputting the garbage information and they're getting garbage out. So, I'm impressed. Uh, on, on the other hand, with something as simple as Google, if you take some of the key symptoms of a patient, fever, anemia, something, whatever, and you type that into the Google, Google search bar, it comes up with a pretty good differential list. Maybe from Wikipedia or something else, but it really does a halfway decent job. So, I won't say it was a dead end, but it was expert systems in those days were all about search. They relied on heuristics. Um, it didn't work as well as we thought it would. So I, I put that away, went to medical school, did medicine for 40 years, came back to robotics as a hobby about 20 years ago. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is my journey through robotics in the last 20 years. And I'll tell you that my approach has largely been trying to push my understanding of robots programming, the hardware, the mechanics, 
people ask me all the time, well, what does your robot do? <coughs> well, it teaches me about programming and mechanics and electronics and physics and math. That's what it does. It doesn't accomplish anything in the end, but it does all those things and it keeps me entertained. So that's what my robot does. So let's start. We started about 20 years ago and I was inspired by the creatures game at the time, which were little cute little creatures on a video game type thing that ran around autonomously. And the idea was that you were supposed to breed them and have them in a world where they perpetuated and somehow evolved. It was a game that was invented by Steve Grand in England. Game is maybe not the right word, because again, there was no point to it other than trying to breed little creatures that would survive. And you would put your little creatures in this virtual world, turn the computer on, go to bed, and come back in the morning, and nine times out of ten, they were all dead. So you tried to find ways of making them better and making them perpetuate. Well, I said, well, why don't we try to do something like that with a real world robot rather than virtual creatures in a virtual world. And I got a couple of people, friends of mine, who were interested, and the LEAF project was born. LEAF uh, has come to have some attention, some notoriety. Uh, the concept is pretty simple. It's a, a computer, in our case it was a laptop, computer on wheels, and somehow the computer controlled wheels and drove the thing around. In those days, we didn't have a lot of off-the-shelf solutions to things. We had a laptop. We had to come up with our own homebrew microcontroller board and did a custom board that would take USB input from the laptop and control the wheel drivers and read the encoders and sonar sensors, things like that. There was a camera hooked directly into the laptop. Here's a picture of me 20 years ago with LEAF. When I say LEAF, LEAF is really the software that runs on the computer that runs all the rest of this. LEAF was an open source free project and got attention from a lot of robot hobbyists at the time. We were working with the Robotics Society of Southern California, but the Seattle Robotics Group was aware of what we were doing and they got some, we got some attention actually in several different countries as well, picking up and porting the LEAF software into their own robots. So the, the physical design of the robot doesn't matter it's the software that counts. This is me with LEAF. And you'll, you'll appreciate my advanced mechanical engineering. If this looks similar to a water softener tank, it's because it's a water softener tank. I needed something to hold the robot face up here. It's on wheels down here, and there's six sonar sensors. The whole thing is empty. There's the robot uh, uh, PC and the camera. I'm really impressed. I thought it was a trash can. <laughs> <laughs> it entered my mind. <laughs> but the family started to grow. So Alex Brown built his own platform. He put the monitor down here. He's got the camera. They all have microphones and speakers. This is Robin Hewitt from San Diego. She built a very similar structure to Alex's. Alex's was called Rocky. Hers was called Mabel. But other people got involved. Henry Arnold built one completely from scratch and put his own monitor and, and then our software. Marcel, who was really a robot um, uh, modeler, built a full-scale R2-D2 and then put LEAF inside. He also built 
a uh, Dalek from Doctor Who and put the software in. Thomas Messerschmidt from the Seattle, from the uh, Riverside Robotics actually went out and bought a full-scale B9 robot and put Leaf software into it. So it's been in different forms over the years. So that was commercially available? Yeah. Really? Yeah, it wasn't cheap, I understand. He wouldn't tell me how much it was, but yeah. He didn't build that one, he bought it. So this was Leaf. Leaf was a collage of programs that I put together. The face animation is from a Colorado University. Uh, CU Animate was the name of the program. It was developed specifically to help deaf and autistic children to speak. There are a series of characters starting with this one and becoming more and more realistically human. The, the focus was on the mouth and tongue movements. Walt Disney was using visemes, you know what phonemes are with speech, but visemes are face movements. Walt Disney was using 12 visemes for its cartoon characters at the time. CU Animate had 16 visemes and software engines that would merge them from one speech pattern into the next. But in addition, it had a number of emotional expressions, all uh, accessible through programming. So I picked the dragon and Leaf would move his, mouth, move his mouth and tongue and smile and show emotional expressions. There's a microphone and speaker so you can talk to him and he would respond. And the camera, so using OpenCD and some software that we developed, it could look at you and recognize who you were and then respond accordingly. And because he had that range of emotions, because we could see it, that was useful. And I decided that this is a robot that's going to be autonomous. So I programmed it. I programmed it in Lisp with a series of emotions that were meant to serve both as motivation. Why would it go do something? Well, it needed some sort of motivation to go do something. And usually that was because it was unhappy. And how was it unhappy? Well, if it was hungry, meaning its battery was running low, that might prompt it to go seek the recharger. And the, motive, the emotions were in a, effectively served in a feedback loop so that if the behaviors go look for the recharger, led to a positive outcome, the battery level went up, then he got more satisfied, happier, and that behavior of going to look for the recharger would be reinforced. So the next time he found himself in that particular world state, he might be more likely to choose that behavior. Now he could choose something else. He could choose to spin in circles. All that would do is run the battery down. And so after a while of spinning in circles, he's less happy. And that means that particular behavior under that set of conditions is less likely to be chosen. And I should add that it's more and less likely. It's never zero. There's always some slim chance, even after he's done something many times, that he might go off and explore a behavior he's visited before or one that he hasn't visited, even though he might know that there's something with a great probability of success. Because if he doesn't ever go out and explore other avenues, he might be missing something. Is this similar to fuzzy logic that you're doing? No, it isn't. So it's, very different. It's, it's a form of reinforcement learning memory, world state, memory, reinforcement learning, 
and and it's autonomous reinforcement learning because he's he's got a measure that he can look at and decide if that was worth doing again. Now, you, I also put in, because he has speech recognition, verbal commands, and you could tell him, Leaf, that's bad, and he would have negative reinforcement from you on a particular behavior, or positive, Leaf, that's good. So you could guide his behaviors, but he could also learn those behaviors. And the sonars would tell if he was in a room that was empty, if it was a room that was crowded, and if he was using the camera, he could tell who he was with. He also remembers all that stuff. So if he's with somebody and he's having good interactions, mainly not being told what to do too much. He didn't like being told what to do. He is autonomous after all. In fact, if you just told him, turn around, turn around, turn around, eventually he'd say, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm not a toy. Quit telling me what to do. Because he's, he's, meant to be autonomous, and he'd become more and more irritated, and his facial expression would show that he's more and more irritated. So we had that range of things for him to do, and he remembered. If he's sitting by himself, and this was kind of the final point I wanted to touch, if he's sitting by himself and things get boring, he could get bored, he might decide, well, what should I do? I think I'll go look for somebody. Well, who should I go look for? And now he can play the what-if game. And the what-if game is, what if I went looking and I found Bruce? What if I went and found Anna? What if I went and I found Gary? And he would remember from previous experiences which person had the most positive interaction. And by thinking about it and playing the what if game before he went off to do something, he could decide, you know, I want to go find Bruce. Gary was no fun. I'm going to go find Bruce. And then he would set off again, figuring, well, where, what time of day is it? Where am I? Where's Bruce likely to be? Let's go find Bruce. So he could use his imagination to play the what-if game to decide who to go find. All this is well and good. In fact, Leaf had so many subsystems, I really like uh, multi-threading, and so we had lots of subsystems running, and lots of interactions, and lots of things going on. There were several things I discovered as I was doing this and maybe he haven't solved everything yet. Definitely haven't solved everything yet. He remembers things, but that means at some point you also got to start forgetting things. Which things do you forget? I'm not sure. But you don't want to fill up memory even if it's a, well in those days you could fill up memory. Now you've got terabyte drives and it's not quite as much of a problem. But at some point you want to forget things. And, and when do you decide to do certain things? Well, it turns out that I would put in parameters for his emotions. And I would put in parameters for some of his behaviors. And I would put in parameters for other features. And I realized the programming is in Lisp, but I'm putting in parameters or weights for some of these things. And actually, I'm kind of doing metaprogramming. I'm setting variables to certain weights and creating, I could easily create a robot that got easily annoyed by setting the weights. Or one that never got annoyed. Or one that got bored easily. Or <coughs> whatever. By setting those weights in what I came to call metaprogramming, 
which you could do intentionally if you were aware of it, but you could also do it quite accidentally if you weren't thinking about it. And so it's a whole other layer of things here that, that sort of developed out of this project. Leaf eventually got to the point where the software was using so many resources, so many different features. We had shared memory. We had the USB uh, communications, the camera, OpenCV, uh, the Lisp software. That the Lisp Works company in England that provided the IDE and the editor for Leaf contacted us when they came out with a new version of their IDE, and Leaf was the beta tester for their software. So Leaf actually had a job as one of the beta testers for their, their software company. But there was a kind of a fatal flaw, and the fatal flaw was all this is great if Leaf can go from this room into the next room, but I had no real easy way to get in there. And that sort of launched the, the journey for the next 15 years of trying to figure out how to get a robot from one place to another. You have to remember, I'm going back in time. This is, the internet exists, Google existed, Wikipedia I don't think existed, maybe it did, but I, didn't, I don't remember seeing it, uh, Alexa, Siri, all of those things hadn't been invented yet. This robot is using the internet, going out for information, to RSS feeds, getting the weather and news headlines. He's able to communicate with other robots running the same software in other parts of the house or other rooms or other houses over the internet through a system we call robot telepathy. And he was using controllers that controlled the lights in the house over X10 controllers, which were the kind of first generation of indoor controls. So, you could say, and we did, Leaf had the control for the lights. The computer in the kitchen did not. <coughs> but it could talk to Leaf over the robot telepathy. So you could say to the computer, and that one's called, cleverly called computer, you could say, computer, turn on the kitchen lights. And it would say, I can't do that. I'll check and see if Leaf is available. And it would talk to Leaf in the robot room over the internet connection. Leaf would say, sure, turn the lights on, come back and say, I did it. And the computer in your kitchen would say, done. My favorite was uh, the one in the kitchen. I'm in the robot room. My wife says, computer, tell Bruce dinner's ready. And Okay, well, I'll tell Leaf. Leaf says, Bruce, dinner's ready. Anna says, dinner's ready. <laughs> Leaf sends back a message, and the computer in the kitchen says, He says, Yes, dear, he'll be right there. And our marriage is saved. So, no, I didn't. But, How do you get a robot to go from one room to another, particularly before all this nice new stuff that we've got, but we'll sort of evolve our way into it? The first one was to use the camera and use just basically the video, because we didn't have all this neural net and all that fancy stuff. We had what were called gates. 
That's kind of a precursor. What you did was you ran the robot down the hallway, taking a series of pictures, and as you're going, it has to keep, you subsequently write the code that tells it that it has to keep the picture centered. So then you start all over again, and you run the robot down, and it's looking at the pictures, the portfolio, if you will, of pictures. And it's trying to keep its current image, match it up with something, and say, well, I'm trying to keep it in the center. And so this is a run, this is an actual run of leaf. Going down the hallway, power was an issue because this thing ran out of batteries quickly, so we plugged in the laptop. Leaf actually had counterweights on the back so it wouldn't tip over. It went down the hallway, and at the end of the hallway is a 90 degree turn, and then a really sharp little short hallway at the end. This is me on the side. The person filming this is Dr. Martin Mason from uh, Mount Sac. He helped me with this filming. And it went through, and that's not a <coughs> space. And that's and without like encoders on the wheels. Or it's not using encoders, it's strictly using vision. vision. So, <coughs> which year was this? Uh, 2005. So this is what it looked like, and and this is what the robot saw going down the hallway with its portfolio of images. It's matching as it goes. <coughs> Which brings us to our club motto, it worked at home. <laughs> That's every robot club's motto. It's the same video as the one I just showed you. Anyway, you can see the lines, you can see the multiple frames superimposed on each other. This is the hallway with the closet door at the end, and gate, 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 all the different images superimposed. And a robot just goes down this passage, tunnel of images, trying to stay in the center. That's what he's seeing as he does what I just showed you. Do you have a play hot key on your keyboard? I have no idea. Well, if you don't see the play button on your keyboard, then no. No. So, that was okay. We took a brief... Um, left turn when Ross came out. When Ross came out, it was incredibly opaque and difficult because there wasn't a lot of documentation for it. You got on the website, you read what they had, you went through their examples. It meant going through Linux. My robot was in Windows. We went to Linux. I managed to get Ross up and running and did a connect depth camera which they had a node for, and used that to go down the hallway. And I could not get it to work. It was impossible. While this had all been going on, the Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C. had developed a robot called George. George was a laptop on wheels with a more human-looking face bald human face, and it used a series of production rules to figure out how to do different tasks. And it looked 
a whole lot like my robot. In fact, I was kind of suspicious that there had been more than a casual association there. I did email them. They did send me their code, which is their source code, which is very nice. I didn't go that direction. When I got to the point of trying to get Leaf to work with Ross and the Connect depth sensor and got stuck, they were kind enough to have Mike Hammer from the National Re from the Naval Research Lab come out to my house and get the thing to work. So Mike Hammer, who's about six foot four and drove up on his big old motorcycle, came in and worked his magic on Ross and got the robot to make a map and go down the same hallway and into the kitchen. And I have no idea what he did, but he made it sort of work. And when I say sort of, the robot went down the hallway halfway, turned, facing the wall, and tried to go through the wall about six times. Mm -hmm. Then it turned the right way and completed the mission without any more hitches. And he was at a loss as to why it did that, and we couldn't make it not do that. And that was Ross. And that was kind of the last I used to connect. So then I thought, well, let's do some mapping, though, might not be a bad idea. And right about that time, lasers, laser scanners started coming out. And the first ones were the Neato laser on the little robot vacuum. And the claim was that they used this rotating 360 degree laser rangefinder to map a room for the robot to vacuum, and it did it well enough that it actually would vacuum the whole room on something very small. So they didn't have very much processing power on that thing, I'm, I'm guessing. It's kind of all proprietary and black box, and I don't really know. but. So, okay, well, let's do something with that laser. And so Chat was born. Chat's the next generation of LEAF. And Chat is a round robot with a laser scanner on top. Still has a camera. This one has a NUC running as the Windows uh, computer. And a Arduino. So I've gone now from a custom motor controller board to off-the-shelf Arduino Mega, and it had Omni wheels. So, well, it's not clear, but but I was about to say clearly, since it has Omni wheels, these Omni wheels have encoders, but I didn't use encoders for mapping. I, I use strictly the laser rangefinder. Now I could have done the math and because the wheels are set at angles, right? They're not going to be the same as a regular uh, two-wheel robot. You, you could have figured out from the encoders the same XY coordinates doing math transition. I didn't do that. I decided not to use encoders at all. And instead have the robot navigating strictly with regard to the laser rangefinder. Now, the difference here is I'm back to Windows. The software I'm using for this is called Tiger Slam. Tiger Slam is something I modified from somebody who was in the Netherlands and did a PhD paper on Slam. It's the whole package. It's mapping, path planning, localization, path following. And for those of you who've done line following, a little caveat. Path following is not the same as line following. It's different. So it's a different kind of algorithm. All in this package. All very nice. Unfortunately, or not, written in Go. So that meant learning Go. So I learned Go programmed all of this to do mapping and slam, and got 
reasonably decent results. Here's the very first ever scanned robot, which you know is, cir is circular, but it's represented as a square. In the robot room, the black lines are the walls. The uh, scatter lines usually were windows. In this case, it was a door. And then there's some random noise from that, that relatively cheap laser scanner. Now, I say relatively cheap. At the time, it was $400. And it was, you know, it was the cheapest on the market. $400, so it was relatively cheap. But I wasn't expecting great results, and I got reasonable results. Going out the door and down the long hallway, I got more of a wall, <coughs> another wall. But you start to see this scatter. And when I finally mapped from the robot room down the hall, this actually was a stairway, and into what was the bedroom, Interesting things started to show up. There's a curve to the map. Now, it's not using odometry to correct. It's just using the LIDAR. But every time I did this, I got the same curve in the map. And, and again, there's something in it. I'm just not exactly sure why it does that, but it did. And a fair amount of noise scattered throughout but enough that it could navigate. And so this actually worked. This was promising because I had, for the first time, a robot that could, a robot of decent size that could go through a standard door. That is not an easy thing to do. You can't do it, or I couldn't do it with sonar. I couldn't do it with any other method I was using. I tried landmarks on the floor, landmarks on the walls. All sorts of other little tricks, not so easy. Mapping turned out to be the solution. And I started thinking, this is where we need to go. And about that time, we got my next robot, which is Hoot. And Hoot looks like this. Hoot is a square robot. Two wheels in front, caster in the back. This time, it's running a Latte Panda Windows. It's got a gigantic seven inch screen on top. And SlamTech. SlamTech is proprietary SLAM being simultaneous localization and mapping. It does with this uh, 360 degree rotating laser, better quality laser. It actually does all of the mapping localization, path planning, and path following in its own processor, which is right underneath the laser and connected to the Latte Panda by an Ethernet cable. Again, way down at the bottom, we've got the Arduino board, which is running sonars and communicating with the RoboClaw motor controller to run the motors. And these we are using the encoders. The encoders feed back into SlamTech. The Latte Panda doesn't... It can find out what the odometry is, but for the most part it doesn't care. The odometry feeds back into SlamTech. SlamTech uses it and the laser to do the mapping. And the Latte Panda, this time running Python, is sending all the commands to the SLAM tech unit and also down to the Arduino and communicating back and forth. Let me come back to this. This is the kind of map I got out of that one. Much cleaner. This is the first map. This is a uh, different room, but it's a robot room. 
uh, the corners are sharp. The this is blown up so the pixels are bigger, but this is me sitting at my desk. Um, much cleaner overall picture. When I went down and out the hallway, the walls again are sharp. The, the spray of LiDAR is into an empty room, it hasn't explored that yet. And this is into another room, it hasn't explored. So there's very little noise coming out of this particular laser. And when I map my entire house, starting in the robot room at the home position, down a long hallway, back into the TV room, back around the dining room, back around the living room, uh, out towards the kitchen. These are three bar stools. These are two potted plants. This is the bedroom. That's the, the king bed in the, bath, in the bedroom. Doorways. Beautiful maps. This map took 15 minutes to make. You tell the robot, you turn the robot on, it's automatically you, defines itself as a home position. You click on the map in an area it hasn't really explored yet, and it goes there. As it goes, it builds the map. You click on another spot, and it goes there. And as it goes, it builds the map. So in starting this, I clicked here, 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 and 15 minutes later, I have a map of the whole house, which it then stores and remembers, and you only do it once. How much did you say that it cost? That's the interesting thing. The whole robot was $500. So that includes, yeah, that includes the new and improved uh, laser scanner, the slamware unit that does the mapping, and all the software that goes with it. And they provided enough information, not easily, but they provided enough information for us to write C and Python books into the software to have it run the robot. Make the maps and run the robot. So the last one didn't work. Let's see if this works. Okay. Yeah, the thing's moving. So, Are we able to turn the sound up on this? So, it's initializing, it is connecting to the internet, it's connecting to Google Assistant. Okay, I'm ready. My name is Hoot, like the sound an owl makes. Where are you? Home location. It starts in the home location. Go to the office. I'm going to the office. Okay, it's already in the office. The office. <laughs> <laughs> the office data point is right about there. So it's going from the home location to the So 
it knows it's moved. Turn counterclockwise 40 degrees. 40 degrees. So it did it did speech parsing. That number wasn't a number programmed in. It figured out the number and did it. <coughs> How old is Sandra Bullock? <laughs> I think she's 56. How old is Abraham Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln was 56 years old. He died in 1865. What's that connected to? Google Assistant? What is the capital of Alaska? Juno is the capital of Alaska. What's it the population of Juno? uses Google uh, speech recognition to figure out what you said and, and analyze that speech. But then it's it's the robot answering the question, not Google's system. Well, so, unless the robot doesn't know the answer to the question, and then it goes out. Then it goes out to Google Assistant. And the speech recognition is far better than anything we used to have. It's certainly on par with Alexa. I think maybe better in terms of its answering capabilities. And you'll notice I never said, Leaf, how are you? Leaf, where are you? It's listening all the time and it's figuring out which things to respond to. So it's it's not like Alexa where you have to use the wake word. We could have done that. But it's always listening, it's always figuring out when it's appropriate to be interactive. It's also running multi-threads. So you can tell it, go to the kitchen, and it goes out the door towards the kitchen. And as it's going, you can say, turn the kitchen light on, and it turns the light on. And you can ask it, how old is Sandra Bullock now? And it'll talk, it's listening and it talks while it's in motion. So it's doing multiple things simultaneously. So that's who. Which brings us to Jeff. So I'm a neuro I'm a neurologist, <clears throat> and over and over again, people said, "Well, then you must know all about neural nets." No, the two have nothing to do with each other. Everyone doing neural nets likes to say it's modeled on neurons and the human brain is not. Nothing oh, remotely similar, I suppose. Like that brick wall over there is modeled on traffic lights. <laughs> That's about as much similarity, you know, different colors and it's, yeah, neural nets and human brain, not that similar. But it's an interesting thing. And I don't know if you knew this, but I was researching this as I was going along in 2010 or thereabouts. Stanford almost dropped neural nets from their core curriculum because they thought it was a dead end. And around that time, they started coming out with better ways of doing back propagation and figuring out mathematical shortcuts essentially because a lot of it's kind of parallelized mathematics going in back propagation. And NVIDIA started coming out, others started coming out with GPUs that allowed you to actually offload some of these things into true parallel processes 
and start accelerating this whole uh, neural net train system. So, so along comes JetBot, and it's based on the, the uh, Jetson Nano, which is the board on top here. The heat sink and the fan are bigger than the board. There's a, an expansion board on the bottom, which basically holds the three batteries, lithium-ion batteries, and a uh, motor controller to run the little DC motors, and a control for the uh, Wi-Fi connection, and... But it's also, it's a module. Right. Actual... Module, that part. part is actually this module right Correct. Here, and that's a carrier just to Correct. break out this stuff. Correct. So this is this kit, the JetBot AI kit. It's from Yalboom. It was 250 bucks. Uh, you put it together with a screwdriver. It's, there's no complicated wiring or soldering. But you get a four core Cortex CPU, which runs about the same as the Raspberry Pi 4, 4B, the new one. And the Raspberry Pi 4B is running 10 times faster than the Raspberry Pi 3. So this is a really souped up little CPU. But in addition, it's got 128 core GPU on board that, that uh, processor board. So you got both with four gigabytes of uh, RAM. Four gigabytes of 64-bit RAM. My first computer that I worked with at the university was a BPAE. Some of you will laugh. Mine was Commodore 64. That came, yeah, as a personal computer. This was a university computer. It had 4K of 8-bit RAM. I, I guarantee I've got everybody here beat. My first computer was a Cosmic Elf. It came with 256 bytes. Bytes. No K, no M. Oh, but yes. And, and I think it cost, it cost $300. Now that there I think you about it, but there was an expansion pack, but yeah. So the PDP 8E, which was 4K of 8 bit memory, I actually programmed it to play chess. It always lost, but it actually moved pieces in the goal. <laughs> <laughs> but 4 gigabytes of 64 bit RAM is hard to picture. I mean, it's, it's such an upgrade. And the whole thing, including the little robot and camera, 250 bucks. Including a software image. And the software image lets you, with a few steps, you put it on an SD card, plug it in, and then when this thing boots, you boot into a Jupyter Notebook. And this is running Py Python, it's running PyTorch, Python, to do neural nets. And the little samples that it gives you. This one is object avoidance. They programmed this on an AlexNet with a thousand a thousand different objects that it could recognize. And they trained it on millions of images. And then using that AlexNet network, you train it on a few images. They suggest a hundred, like the side of the wall, the, the door, different objects in the room, and a hundred or so open spaces. So it now knows two objects, open and blocked to do object avoidance as it runs around. And you're training it on a net that's been pre-trained. So what you're doing is transfer learning. You're taking somehow 
having trained it on a thousand objects, it knows knows something about objects. It's extrapolated some information in that network about what an object is. So when I give it a hundred objects in the room and a hundred open spaces in the room, it's already generalized something. And now it can, on just 200 images, it can figure out open space, blocked space. And the algorithm for this demo is very simple. If it's open, you go straight. If it's blocked, you turn left. That's all it does to behave. Well, I torture things when I do my experiments. I, for a long time, I said, I like to do proof of concept. I like to do cutting edge and often find myself on the bleeding edge of that cut. And so I said, well, gosh, 200 images. Move, take a picture, move, take a picture. It's boring, I'll do 30 total. So I did it with 30 images, 15 blocked, 15 open. Way less than what they said you were supposed to do, but this is what I got as a result. I'm standing. I'm standing here. You won't see it, but it reacts to my foot there. This was kind of an accident. There's a new, there's a piece of paper on the floor that wasn't there when I trained it. And it saw the paper and it turned. And I didn't teach it paper. But it recognized that was blocked. It also came over here, and you don't see on the image, but there's the, the wire for the camera. And it, it avoids the wire. So it runs around, and it doesn't run into anything with very few training images. It, we're, we're kind of headed towards the doggy cart idea. Not quite, but you know what I mean. This is going to be important when I get to the point of asking you all a favor. So just remember this, blocked and non-blocked images. So can you train it with the opposite? Yeah. Opposite of what's not. Say, just show it a bunch of blocked images and say it's open and vice versa. Yeah, you could. We're going to just run into things. Yeah, you run into things. See, it, see how big it is. Good. Yeah, that would, that would conflict with its prior training, actually. So it would probably become. Oh no! Years. You're 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 still going to recognize. I see what you're saying. I don't know. You didn't know that. Sort of mess it up. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I think it would be an interesting uh, to, to do that and then compare it with human. Um, you know, humans who have problems or traumas or something that don't match prior. You're more sadistic than I am, you guys. Yeah. I can, I can see that now, but okay. It's better that we torture the robots. Though. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. So, okay, this is not, and again, I, I mean it is, but I, I want to say this is not line following. You use a different sensor for line following, usually, or you use a different algorithm in OpenCV, and you, you try to stay on the center of the line. And in fact, my first line follower was a uh, drone that followed a line on the floor and flew up above it using OpenCV and ROS. And this is using pictures. This is a lot more like 